Greetings. I'm Vishaka Desai, and I'm the Chair of Committee on Global Thought at Columbia University. On behalf of CGT, as well as our outreach partners, the Society of Fellows, the Heyman Center for Humanities, the European Institute, and the Undergraduate Committee on Global Thought, it's my very great pleasure to welcome all of you to this special and timely program, the state of the world economy in the age of COVID and beyond. CGT or Committee on Global Thought is a presidential initiative at Columbia University organized around the principle that forms processes and the base around which the world is changing actually require new forms of thinking across intellectual borders as well as national borders. And this is mainly to create new form of what I call synthetic learning and thinking to address the issues that we face in these unprecedented times. COVID and the pandemic crisis that we have faced in this past year is a perfect example of why we need new thinking and new ways of approaching the world. Along with the health crisis that obviously was crushing the world, the other big crisis that we faced was, and the changes that we faced was in the global economic systems. While the implications of the pandemic are still unfolding, especially in economic terms, it's very clear that some things are beginning to emerge. And while we may not understand all of it, I am grateful that we have two of the best minds with us today to really help us think about and learn about and understand the implications of the crisis on the global stage, especially when it is about the economy of the world, not just of one place or another. The impetus for this program really came because of the book that Professor Adam Toos has just written entitled Shutdown, How COVID Shook the World's Economy. But as Professor Toos, when I approached him, mentioned, he said, I don't wanna just talk about the book. And my thought was one of the people I know who can really have a lot to say about this was another good colleague of mine. And uh, I can also even say almost a friend because Professor Raghuram Rajan has been such a big player in thinking about global economy, but especially when it comes to the role of central banks, especially because of his role as the former Reserve Bank Governor of India. So what we're gonna to do today is after I give a brief background about both of them, is we're really gonna let them have a conversation with each other. And then I will invite all of you, the attendees and participants to write in the chat functions of questions you have. And we will spend the last 15 minutes or so to really take your questions and discuss that with both of our uh, speakers today. So uh, a brief word, and I say brief because I wanna make sure that we have time for them to have a conversation that we can partake of. Um, Professor Adam Toos is currently the Catherine and Shelby Cullum Davis Professor of History, the Director of European Institute at Columbia University, and also a member of the Committee on Global Thought. Uh, prior to coming to Columbia, he actually has taught at Yale, also at Cambridge, where he also um, studied before that, and his PhD is from the London School of Economics. But most importantly, he has written multiple books, all of which have received prizes. Um, the book that often people think about when we think about Adam Toos is the Deluge, the Great War, America, and the Remaking of the Gold, uh, Global Order, 1916 to 1931, as well as the book just before his newest book that I mentioned, 
is Crashed, How a Decade of Financial Crisis Changed the World, which was written in 2018. Um, Dr. Raghuram Rajan is currently the Catherine Dusak Miller Distinguished Service Professor of Finance at the Booth School of Business at Chicago, at University of Chicago. He was also the 23rd governor of the Reserve Bank of India between September 2013 and September 2016. And in that position, I have to say that often he was referred to as one of the best governors of central, one of the cent big central banks in the world. Um, he was also the chief economist and director of research at the International Monetary Fund. And his research interests range from banking, corporate finance, and economic development, especially the role that finance plays in it. He has also uh, been an author of multiple books, but the last book that he wrote, The Third Pillar, How the State and Markets Are Leaving Communities Behind, which is the book that he published in 2019, really has been something that I know for those of us who think about Global South, but also other places, really think about how communities play a role in these economic systems. And again, with the pandemic crisis, we see that when these pieces don't come together, the fallout is pretty disastrous. And that is something that I hope we will have a chance to hear about as well. Um, there are lots of quotes for books that both of them have written, but I'm not gonna go through that, except to say that you both have thought a lot about central banks and the role of central banks in the economic system, especially when we come to this moment in time. You both are also prolific in terms of your public intellectual roles. Adam, I can't keep up with your tweets and your uh, the things that come out of your mind. And uh, Raghu, I'm just delighted that you also continue to be very active in the role of, you, of somebody like you, both as a committed public servant and a committed public intellectual. So thank you for joining us. But let me just start with first question and then I'm gonna let you two go at it as it were. So the first question is your interest, um, Adam, your interest in central bank and um, Professor Rajan, of course, your work at the Reserve Bank of India at this particular moment and during this crisis, how do you think about the role of central bank and its implications for the global economy? Well, thank you so much, Shaka, for that lovely introduction. And, and can I also extend my personal thanks to Agar and Rajan for agreeing to be on this panel with me. It's a, it's a considerable thrill. And if, if I was able to, to nominate another book, it, looking back, in fact, to my work on the 2008 crisis, it would be Raghu's book, Fault Lines, from 2010, 2011, which is an extraordinarily capacious um, under, uh, portrayal, really, of the tensions within the global economy, some of the themes of which I think are still very relevant, and I hope we'll come back to them in the course of our conversation today. So yes, this theme of central banks is something we have in common, and, and it's very difficult, of course, to look past it in relation to the events of, of, recent, of, of, of recent months, going back to the spring of 2020. It's worth saying, perhaps, that even before COVID hit, the issue of central banks and their role in the world economy was hugely controversial. And Raghu was one of the central bankers around the world in the thick of that argument about their new role, their politicization, their almost perpetual interventions in uh, bond markets. But what we saw in the spring of 2020, really most particularly in March, but it's an ongoing process now, are interventions on a scale that we've just never, we've never seen before. I mean, the, the basic models were outlined in 2008, but it's worth recalling, I think, the gigantic scale of Fed intervention in that moment, I mean, the numbers are just staggering. They were, by my calculation, buying a million dollars of assets a second in the last week of March. They were buying between 75 and $80 billion every working day of the week. They bought 5% of the US Treasury market in a matter of weeks. And the US Treasury market is the bedrock of the global financial system. 
um, which is generally thought, as it were, to have such inertial, inherent stability properties that the idea of having to um, stabilize it by buying 5% of it in a, in a matter of weeks is, is really shocking. I think we have to ask, and, and I, I would love to get Raghu's views on this, is like what this means. Because this is a, a pretty dramatic denaturing, if you like, of one of the markets which we generally think of as being the bedrock of the system. And I think in thinking about what's happening here, I mean, it's worth distinguishing different drivers. If we stand a long way back, one of the reasons I call the book shutdown and not lockdown is that if you stand a lot, long way back, what's happening, if you like, is the central banks are underpinning underwriting, enabling a private flight to safety. I mean, that's the fundamental role they're performing. I avoided talking about lockdowns because for this specific area, maybe the fear of a lockdown somewhere down the line was a driver, but basically this is a private sector driven multi-trillion dollar drive to cash between February and March, which the central banks are enabling to accommodating. There are in the central bank purchases a impetus which is conventional QE in the sense of using the blunt instruments that are available to mother to central banks to try and prop the economy up. That is, as it were, the role they appear to be playing now. Then there is, as it were, I think, in the crisis, especially on the left, the fantasy almost, the hope, the sort of, if you look at it this way, from this angle kind of idea that what the central banks were doing is backstopping fiscal policy. In other words, they were buying government debt to enable the giant fiscal policies, which are also such a powerful impression of this crisis, to go forward. As if we were in the 1940s and 1950s, as if we were in World War II, when that is explicitly the bargain that was brokered. And if you stand a very long way back, or indeed if you ask many market participants, they appear to be quite seriously convinced that that is what they were doing. And I think in Europe, you might make a case for saying that something like that is what the ECB is involved in. In other words, they are propping up the sovereign debt market first and foremost. They're avoiding a blowout in spreads in Italy. They are thereby enabling the broader construction of the fiscal apparatus of Europe to go ahead without the big political deals initially that would make that possible. They are continuing the Mario Draghi mandate to do whatever it takes. And believe me, it will be enough. But if you actually open the lid on what's happening in New York and London in March 2020, you see a third reality behind these huge central bank purposes, which is not fiscal dominance in the sense of the fiscal impetus driving this, the need to backstop the huge measures that the Congress is, for instance, going to do, but what you might call financial dominance. In other words, the overwhelming priority is to secure financial stability, because what's unraveling in the second and third week of March is highly leveraged trades based on treasury securities in complicated ways we don't need to get into here but basically a variety of hedge fund strategies and the unraveling of and the selling off of reserve assets being held by various fund managers notably in the emerging market world in this moment not so as to exit the dollar but so as to get at dollar liquidity as quickly as possible so behind what looks like a kind of synchronized action between fiscal and monetary policy are, in fact, I think all the way down to the present day, a considerable confusion about what central bank policy is doing, an overlaying of different motives, some really quite serious cognitive dissonance between what's inside the bank and what's outside projected onto the bank. And this, you could also say, is the continuation of where we've really been since 2008 in this murky, highly politicized world in which the politics of central bank interventions have blown open in a way we haven't seen really since the advent of the new model in the 1980s and 1990s, which is why it's so interesting from a political thought point of view. And it's not just an advanced economy situation. This, of course, has reverberations, as Raghu was in the forefront of pointing out in 2013. This has reverberations throughout the world. This affects the credit conditions under which all the major emerging markets can buy. And it poses the question which you know, which has been, I know, on Raghu's agenda and radar now for years, which is how do we continue this kind of model? Are you seriously going to, as it were, continue this program of QE forever, to infinity forever? Will it not have distortionary effects on private credit? Is this a sustainable model? And Raghu, you had a piece in Project Syndicate recently, which 
I thought was very interesting in raising a whole variety of different dimensions of this problem, which are not perhaps as widely appreciated and, and uh, uh, discussed. Because right now it seems like a stable situation. Inflation expectations sort of seem semi-anchored. Interest rates are low. What's not to like about this makeshift? Is this something we can continue forever? Yeah, well, it looks like nirvana, doesn't it? Yeah. And uh, and um, I think there are deep problems building. But let me start first by saying, uh, you know, you wrote the definitive book on the on the global financial crisis. Uh, it was it came after a lot of books, but everybody who reads it tells me that you know this is the book. Just like Galbraith's book is sometimes thought of as the book definitive book uh, uh, about the depression. So first, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's interesting that uh, you went late then but you went early on the pandemic. <laughs> the sh shutdown is, is one of the first books I've seen. And, and, and I, I think it's a, it's a uh, very, very uh, interesting and, and well poised at the beginning of this year for what will come. So um, I'd love to hear more about what you think. I mean, while we're on the issue of, of, of central banks, I mean, I clearly think we've gone too far. But we've gone so far that it's very hard to back off. And oh. that's, the, that's the problem that central banks are finding themselves in. I mean, you just talked about the astounding intervention in March this year. And central banks will say, yeah, you know, that was needed. Treasury, uh, you know, treasuries were trading at, at ridiculous yields. Uh, spreads were blowing out in every market. If we hadn't uh, intervened, all hell would break loose. That's true. That's true. The question you have to ask is, why did we get to this pass? What prompted the hedge funds to take these big bets? Uh, what prompted the leveraging to take place? What prompted all this capital to go to emerging markets in such a big way? And yeah, everybody's happy when you intervene, but nobody's asking, well, what came first? And why did we get to this pass? And, and, and I think what is very important in what you say is the view is you know, maybe the threat is central bank independence. They're dominated by the government. Fiscal dominance is the, is the technical term that economists use for this. Uh, the, the central bank very willing to buy government paper. This is what many emerging markets got away from in the uh, 90s and the 2000s because they were essentially uh, sort of prisoners of, uh, of government fiscal policy. And... Uh, you know, uh, industrial country central banks did it way before. And now what the argument is they've gotten back into uh, being captive. But I think the greater threat is what you alluded to, which is central banks are now prisoners of the market. Mm -hmm. And and that is much more problematic because, um, you know, when we have such a massive intervention, uh, it's very hard to go back. Because you've you've essentially said, you know, 2008 had, you know, created all the programs, which became the set piece for 2020. And not only did we do all those programs, we did a whole lot more uh, intervening in the corporate bond markets for the first time, for example, in the US. And the question is, how do you get away from it? And, and when you look at uh, central bank efforts to get away from it. I mean, take uh, Ch Chairman Powell. He came in basically saying, I want to effectively, he never said it explicitly, but effectively that the central bank put, which was earlier termed the Greenspan put, then the Bernanke put, eventually the Yellen put, that is the uh, belief in the markets that the central bank was backstopping it and any fall in the market would be accompanied by central bank intervention. He said, we, we, we don't care about market volatility. And not only did he say it, but a bunch of Fed presidents also said it. And, you know, this uh, Federal Reserve was going about raising interest rates. Uh, 2018, President Trump yelling from the sides, uh, imposing some of his uh, tariffs and creating a little bit of concern in the real, uh, real economy. But the Fed went on and said, no way are we going to turn around. In December 2018, uh, it turned on a dime. Yeah. Uh, beginning of December, it was saying, no, no way, things are fine. There was no news in December, except the stock markets tanked. 
Yeah. And I think the Fed came in at that point, and the notion that there was no Fed put just went out of the window. The Fed put was alive and well, even with somebody as determined as Chairman Powell. And we saw the so same my... thing in Europe, right? With the ECB also putting its foot back on the gas in 2019, doing a little bit of QE. A- absolutely. Last battle. Um... Uh, right. And, and, and to some extent, uh, you know, this has gotten... Oh, if the market stank, there will be wealth effects. Or oh, if the market stank, there will be sentiment effects. Or oh, if they tank, you know, this will happen, that will happen. We already have a weak recovery. We can't afford it. Mm-hmm. And so what we've done is effectively pumped up the markets. I mean, take some of the numbers. Uh, look, in the, you know, bankruptcies typically go up in, in bad times. Bad, bankruptcies went down, not just for the large firms, but for small firms across the industrial world during the pandemic. Mm-hmm. That reflects the extent, not just of monetary intervention, we'll come to fiscal intervention in a second. Cryptocurrencies trading at 2.5 trillion. I mean, yeah. for, for an asset that is relatively untested. I mean, we don't need to get <laughs> into Bitcoin. That's, and, a, that's and, a polite and way valuation. of describing it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but it's, it's just, I mean, uh, you know, uh, I, I think we can pick many areas where you have to start worrying what is sustainable in all this. And is the central bank being called in to do bigger and bigger and bigger interventions? And at what point does it stop? Now, we can talk about where it where it ends. I do think, and this was the point of my project syndicate piece, that central banks, by expanding their balance sheets significantly, are one, creating fiscal problems because effectively they're shortening the maturity of government debt. But I would argue, and this is some uh, research that we're doing, that they are actually causing liquidity problems also. It seems like they're creating a lot of liquidity by you know, putting out a whole bunch of reserves. But how are commercial banks financing it? They're financing it with demandable claims. So offsetting this huge pool of, of reserves is a huge pool of deposit liabilities. And the two essentially offset each other, creating the kind of liquidity crises that we saw in, in uh, in um, September of 2018, uh, September of 2019. I mean, the, I, I think we have fragile financial markets, but it seems like no one has any worries because the central bank is backing these markets. Do you think we could tell a more optimistic story if we looked on the fiscal side? Because for a long period, um, really beginning, I guess, in the US with the Republican victory in the 2010 midterms, which produced gridlock in Congress, and with the austerity turn in Europe at that moment, the G20 resolutions on austerity, you know, the narrative was essentially that fiscal policy was paralyzed, and at least the Keynesian narrative was that, right? And that was part of the problem, because that basically meant that the only policy game in town was was QE. The central bankers, you know, they they would say it doesn't work in theory, it does work in practice, which is basically like saying, you know, you're going to hit the old television with your slipper to make the picture come sharp. And no one knows why, but, you know, it seems to work. And that, as it were, fed in. It was the cognitive side of the capture that you're talking about and the political side of it. There was no alternative. Whereas surely one of the promises of 2020, certainly in response to the crisis itself, was that we saw fiscal policy action of commensurate scale. I mean, some would pay, some would say excessive, no doubt, but relative to the fiscal action we saw after 2008, nine, very dramatic, bipartisan in the US for at least two rounds of it until we, you know, until the, the White House flipped. And very dramatic. I mean, you, it seems to me you can tell it in two different ways. A Keynesian would say precisely what we needed, essentially replacing the loss of demand. An Austrian might be tempted to say another one of these bizarre actions where there's no downside, right? Poverty goes down, there's full income replacement. And the defense, I guess, is that there's no moral hazard argument here. You know, people didn't bring this unemployment upon themselves. It was in fact, it was in fact, as it were, a service that you provided to the community to stay at home, to contribute to the social distancing project. And so there we see the possibility of a better policy mix. How this relates to the previous conversation for the listeners is that if you've got fiscal policy acting in a stabilizing way, then you can, in fact, begin to normalize monetary policy without the fear that you'll just, as it were, collapse the economy because you can right. use fiscal policy to offset. Do you, are you, I mean, would you buy into that or do you see fiscal policy in a similar sort of dead end of, 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 of excessive overextension? No, I, look, uh, let's start first with um, 
the fact that, uh, you know, central bankers are like the dog that was chasing the car saying, you know, hey, wonderful. And then it caught the car and didn't, didn't know what to do with it. Central bankers have been protesting about being the only game in town for the last 10 years. Uh, we need fiscal to step up. And suddenly fiscal stepped up in such a huge way that now central bankers have a framework which is sort of attuned to a situation where they're the only game in town. Yeah. And, and suddenly they're not. And, and we should say, shouldn't we, for the audience, that all of this is a weird, topsy-turvy kind of postmodern reality, right? Because when independent central banking got going, it was all about taming politicians exactly. who were supposed to be like fiscal spendthrifts throwing money out the window, like Donald Trump, essentially. He was a kind of classic populist. And the idea of the independent central bank was to curb all of that. And as you're saying, as we hit the lowflation world of the 2000s post-2010, the central bankers ended up being cheerleaders for, like you're saying, chasing the car of like politics and going, right. bark, 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 give us some fiscal stimulus. And now they've got it. And yeah. we're in this sort of multiply reversed world. Exactly, Adam, precisely because the problem no longer was high inflation, it was low inflation. Low inflation yeah. and, and central banks were chastised from the left, from the right, you're keeping inflation too low, you're failing on your inflation targets. And they do all these extraordinary things some of which I complain about, in order to elevate inflation. And, you know, suddenly the fiscal spigot opens and opens wide, and there is no constraint. And now they're, they have, they're back to the old problem, except their framework, they shifted their framework to deal with yeah. the immediate problem, which is lowflation. And now, of course, they're all puzzled. What do we do? Do we shift framework again and say the problem is high inflation? This is or... another element coming in, right? Because there's the supply side element that really no one has a macro theory about. Like, you know, the fact of the matter, you know, the fact that senior senior officials are now, you know, seriously concerned with operating three shifts in the port of LA. It's like, exactly. this wasn't part of anyone's calculus, right? No one right. has an algorithm for doing economic policy where that matters. So, uh, absolutely. You know, as also the shifting, you know, problems, uh, today is China, tomorrow is Malaysia, the supply chains are getting hit everywhere in the world. And of course, we have this energy problem, which yeah. is partly driven by climate change, sort of, uh, uh, okay. sort of putting constraints on what kinds of energy sources can be used, the price of carbon in Europe skyrocketing and people then moving to natural gas. So a lot of things are coming together. That's, that's the interesting part. But in this uh, environment, I mean, just to complete the thought on fiscal, um, you know, part of the reason there was bipartisan support in the US was you opened the tap as wide as you could. Anybody who <laughs> could make a claim, including the airlines, I mean, the airlines had no claim, or, I mean, they took massive amounts, but lots of people got, you know, the banks, uh, some of the help to the small businesses, no conditions attached, money came in through the front door, went out through the back door to pay the banks. Now, some people will say, yeah, we, we, we saved the economy from a great depression. Yes, possibly. But at what cost? And then the question is, who pays for it? In a world of low inflation and low interest rates, nobody pays for it, at least in our thinking, because we keep pushing it forward and, and debt service goes down, wonderful, etc. Of course, the reality is the savers pay for it, but who cares about the savers? They're rich people. Again, it's not really all the rich people. Many of us have, pens uh, you know, have pensions, which, which do invest in this stuff. But also we need to think about the fact that we've built up huge amounts of debt. And those are generational debts. Those are not debts that are paid down over the business cycle. Those are debts we're going to hand over to the next generation to pay. And so the real question is, you know, are we actually... Uh, have we, in a sense, jeopardized their future by building up these levels of debt? The only way to, to sort of offset that is by creating strong, sustainable growth, doing all the good things to mm -hmm. make their life better, climate uh, investment, et cetera, et cetera. The real question is, will all this money that has been spent sort of end up just subsidizing consumption for a little while? Now, if it's well targeted, that's great. If it's not well targeted, it goes to a bunch of traders who buy cryptocurrency, that's not particularly useful. But also, are we building the investment for the future? That's why I think the most important bill before Congress is this infrastructure bill. Uh, now, I also think part of, you know, we have to build human capital infrastructure. That's, 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 that's important. We have to, 
But we need to think about it carefully. What I see instead is this avalanche of money with the only condition being it should not go to anybody who makes more than 400,000. Where did that 400,000 come from? Why isn't stuff better being better targeted? It's partly because it's available to all constituencies. It's available to your constituency. It's available to my constituency. That's why we get an agreement. Mm -hmm. So I, I do worry that the fiscal is not well targeted. There are massive needs going forward. And if we spend too much without targeting it effectively, we won't be able to address many of the needs which are going to come down the line, yeah. including the consequences of climate change, the catastrophes we have to deal with, but also the mitigation efforts, as well as, of course, the technological efforts to reduce it. For me, this takes us back to one of the, the um, really, I thought, very profound insights of your fault line book. And this is also partly a transatlantic contrast, which I think is interesting about this moment. <laughs> which is that there's a systemic, there's a structural logic to this somewhat headless chicken mode of American policymaking, where the crucial thing is building the coalition to get it through Congress, you know, and so that's where the, the logic comes from, which is that there are so few structural guardrails in the American social constitution, if you like, that A, at the moment of crisis, your unemployment insurance system fails, so you basically have to build out an improvised system. Then, of course, we have the, the historic now, and, and this was a theme that neither of you or I think really got the full measure of, the, the scale of the Trump crisis, which is energizing the Democrats in a way that I think we cannot underestimate. Right? They think, uh, quite rightly, in my view, that the future of democracy in America is at stake, and so they need to do things to avoid the Republicans making a breakthrough which is a, you know, it's an investment of a political type in the structural stabilities of the US Constitution. And of course, they're trying to fix what are by OECD standards, lamentably inadequate investments in human capital, early childhood education, you know, family policy, and so on. And they're trying to do all of this in real time under massive political pressure. And they have to, right, for very good reason. So targeting goes down your list of priorities and getting bills through goes up your list of priorities, making the numbers big, giving yourself a chance at the midterms. Whereas what we saw in Europe, somewhat, so my mind, it took me by surprise. Early on in the crisis, March, April, it looked like Europe was going to fail again in a predictable way. And then they failed to fail in that way. And instead, I think what emerged was precisely the contrast that you outlined. Um, which is that the robustness and complexity of Europe's social insurance systems and labor market institutions gave it a huge advantage, which is that they, there really was no unemployment crisis in Europe in 2020, because that doesn't mean that people weren't shocked or that they weren't furloughed, but they went into short time working systems that absorbed them into relatively secure positions. And that creates space for political agency, because then you're not basically trying to, you know, bail water frantically the way that the Americans were. And they have, you could say typically European, like they've built a very fancy Italian car. You know, they've engineered an incredibly targeted investment program focused on digital, focused on, 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 on tech um, and, and green, which is, you know, in a sense is the envy, I think, of American strategists, because it, it, it has that quality. For me, the worry there, though, is that in a sense, the big political questions still overshadow all of this. It's not obvious to me that we're really out of the woods. Well, let, let, let me ask you about that. I mean, it seems to me that, uh, that Europe, uh, certainly because of it, its existing safety net, could focus on, on, on the need for recovery and, 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 and a way to do it in an effective way. And the recovery funds uh, you know, demand a lot of governments in, in terms of specifying what exactly they will do. And so mm. that, all that is to the good. But is the counterpart of, of not having a system uh, in Europe really what the ECB has had to do, yes. which is to some extent backstop all the governments yeah, uh, yeah. effectively? And, and, you know, to some extent, people argue that, you know, the European financial safety net is already in there. It's the ECB. Uh, yeah. You know, forget the deposit insurance. The ECB is going to effectively backstop the big So the phrase I use to describe both political regimes is Frankenstein in the sense that it kind of works, you know, it's animated, it probably talks, but it's got a bolt sticking out and, you know, visible scars. And in the US case, they're just so manifest and we live them all the time. And it's kind of the trauma that we're all living through. 
But in the European case, it's more, it's buried and it has to be buried because it's so hotly political that it will explode if it's exposed, basically. And the next gen EU element is the shiny bauble, the bit they're super pleased with, the wedding cake of like, you know, common fiscal policy. It's all lovely. But most of that is long term stuff. It won't work for another two, three years. It's very slow moving. The actual fiscal action, the counterpart to CARES, was all done at the national level. And it was basically a free for all, exactly as you described it. They removed all of the you know, highly engineered fiscal rules, anti-subsidy regulation the Europeans have. All of those breaks came off. National governments were free to do what they wanted. And that was a sheer, that was a clear recipe for bond market chaos if the ECB didn't step in. And the big turning point is third week of March when the ECB has one of its climactic meetings and agrees to act this time round and not to do the sort of cat and mouse game they played in 2010, 2011, but just to stand squarely behind the sovereigns, all of them declare all of their assets purchasable, including Greek debt, which you know they, they previously couldn't buy, certainly Italian debt. And that's what's holding this whole thing together. But it rests on no one asking the question, which is now going to be asked, which is how long can we do this for? Are we really going to allow a no rule system for the foreseeable future? And is the ECB really legally entitled to do what it's doing? And the German Constitutional Court has already indicated its limits, which is to say they are entitled to do this in the case of an exceptional emergency. But if instead the ECB admits to doing what it's doing, which is stabilizing bond markets and doing just old fashioned QE, in other words, price stability, preventing deflation, they're in all sorts of trouble beyond the fall of 2022. So that's where I think the ramshackle unresolved quality of these arrangements is going to manifest itself on the European side too. And we see well, we, it's why the German negotiations matter so much right now, because who's in well, the German finance ministry is critical to this. Well, that's uh, I'm, we got to talk a little bit about China before ending this tour of the world. But let, let me ask you, uh, before uh, you, you, you talk about China, um, what's different about Europe this time in terms of its response? Uh, you know, safety nets, we understand they work. But, but beyond that, the recovery fund and, um, you know, what, what, what was different about the European landscape? And, and then, um, you know, your thoughts on China would be great. I think it's important to say the safety next one shouldn't think of the European welfare state as static, as not having a history. The short time working thing is a hugely underestimated innovation in welfare state design. And the guy who was responsible for it in Germany was Olaf Scholz when he was a Labour minister in the, the first Angela Merkel coalition. And he, you could argue, if you wanted to have the ultimate great man theory of this, you'd say that Olaf Scholz's coalition at the German finance ministry was also one of the key differences between 2020 and 2008 or 2010. To put it in less personalistic terms, the German political class, or at least one part of it, has learned. They've learned lessons. The banging on their, you know, that we just subjected them to relentless criticism from the other side of the Atlantic and also within Europe. And there's a substantial element of the German political class which has learned the lesson that the ECB has to be able to act like a conventional central bank in moments of crisis. And you then need to provide political leverage and backstop for that. You do need to move towards some sort of fiscal construction and the willingness of the finance ministry to push the door open in Angela Merkel's chancellery. If you just want one factor, that I think is a key issue. Also, this didn't go to the banks. That's very important. The banks were more robust. They're not in great shape in Europe, but we didn't have that spiral. Those are those are key issues. We, we, we must talk about China. Um, and you can kind of make a segue in the sense that I think we're all the Europeans, the Americans, everyone is just trying to get a handle on the pace of events. Because the Europeans at the end of 2020, you know, one of the reasons they ended the year feeling quite complacent was that was the summit at which they got the whole next gen EU thing sewed up. But it's also the, the month in which they, you know, did this comprehensive agreement on investment with China, the CAI. And that caused a bit of a scandal in the US, but in terms of the policy of Merkel and Macron and, and von der Leyen, this was kind of the, the high point really of their understanding of how they had brokered a deal with the Chinese. They were gonna go with a kind of appeasement orientated detente and it's blown up. And it didn't blow up because of American opposition or because of European opposition, or rather it blew up indirectly because of European opposition because Political action, sanctioning some mid-level Chinese officials responsible for Xinjiang, provoked this incredible response from China. And that's what no one had reckoned with, right? We thought this was for us 
us to decide what terms we engage with China on. But what's really become clear is it's absolutely up to them to decide what terms they will accept engagement with us. And I think we're seeing that in economic policy as well, right? She is pushing a strong transformative line now on the Chinese economy. You did a piece about this recently. No, in for Project for sure. I, and it's, it's interesting. I mean, uh, of course, there are big changes in, in China, but uh, I think uh, a lot of it is she shaping China in the way he wants, right? Yeah. He just made a speech a uh, couple of days ago on 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 his economic uh, thinking. Um, I mean, my my sense is there is a broader strategy which predates Xi, which is uh, sort of reducing their dependence on on industrial countries for markets, trying to develop their own markets. You know, we were talking about it with the Chinese when I was at the IMF. Uh, mm -hmm. and trying to persuade them to uh, to liberalize their currency but but uh, i think what she has embarked on right now is really a much uh more this is my way and i want to make sure it happens before i leave which may be 10 years 15 years from now but uh in in that i think is is uh, first a profound distrust of the rest of the world <laughs> and, and and a sense that it's standing in china's way of way to greatness i mean we we caricature that sometimes but i think that's a real feeling uh, uh coupled with the feeling that america has passed its prime and mm -hmm. and and therefore uh, there is a space which china can fill uh, but also, um, you know, a sense that the private sector in China needs to be brought under control. Now, whether it's under control or, or totally subservient, not clear. But, but the sense is that it can be managed without losing the vibrancy that, that the private sector brings. And of course, this point that if we do want more domestic demand, we have to have more common prosperity. Our households have to be richer, which means get away from the low wage low uh, you know, uh, savings rates model of the past, which allowed China to grow, but towards you know, much more sensible market-based wages, as well as higher returns on investment. But in order to do that, they got to do, make big changes. They got to have better, <clears throat> better jobs for their households and more well-paying jobs. They have to have, have a financial sector which allocates capital properly rather than based on cheap capital. They have to get away from the property sector being the, the way, you know, the button they press every time they want growth with uh, the crazy uh, sort of investment as well as crazy prices. I mean, prices in, in Chinese, big Chinese cities are 20 times income, average income. I mean, that's that's extraordinary. And and so in a sense, what what I think they're doing is trying to change all this boosted by the fact that they were quite successful in their fight against COVID uh, initially. And, and that has made them sense that this is a time, let's get all this done when the rest of the world is also preoccupied. And I'm afraid that they're trying to do a lot together. Uh, they've certainly been successful in the past, but I worry that they think they can reverse some of what they're doing if it proves to be uh, overly complicated, but they are a much more complicated economy. And, uh, and uh, there's lots of, uh, you know, connections, uh, work on the property sector, uh, you know, uh, bring prices down. Uh, essentially, a lot of households feel that they don't have enough, in, you know, um, wealth because uh, housing is a big source of wealth due then, you know, curb consumption. Uh, similarly, many percent, isn't it? 80 percent of household wealth in China, I think, is tied up with real estate. It's really absolutely. Absolutely. On, on, right. On so, the... so you may end up sort of opening a lot of cans uh, mm -hmm. and, and lots of worms coming out and whether you can shut them down. I, I know I'm mixing many metaphors, but whether <laughs> you can put everything back, uh, I, I, I worry. Uh, I do worry that we, we have immense confidence in China because it's managed so far, but they're attempting something dramatic. And, uh, and I don't know if they have the capability. I mean, remember, Japan also uh, in the late 80s tried to reform the economy for the new new era. Uh, didn't quite work out. Yeah. Thank you both. Um, there is, I know there's so much to hear, so much to talk about, um, but there are also questions coming in. So I want to take a little bit of a moment, but just before we go to the questions that are already in the chat. I wanted to just ask you, Raghu, and, and uh, you also, Adam, 
that when it comes to China and what you're talking about is the economic changes and much of that it seems to me is also going to require political changes. The question is whether both of those can come together as far as China is concerned and how they would manage it or is it a very tight rope? No, I, I, I think from the Chinese perspective, uh, whatever I can make out, and I'm not a China expert, but from uh, what I can make out from uh, what I read about Xi, it's very clear. Uh, the party is supreme. Right. The system works. Uh, look at how they dealt with COVID versus how the United States is dealing with COVID. Um, and that sort of license, uh, that legitimizes the party's sort of uh, uh, occupying the commanding heights, uh, which means that private entrepreneurs who attempt to, you know, uh, occupy the limelight, uh, better answer for their for what they're doing. And, uh, you know, let, let's be frank, a lot of what the Chinese are doing with respect to their tech companies are things that some of our democratic mm -hmm. friends in the US would like to do. Uh, but are constrained by, uh, you know, the legal system, the antitrust system, etc. That said, I think there is value to, you know, pausing this and not having every mid-level bureaucrat able to target, you know, his favorite, uh, his favorite uh, concern. And I worry that what, what you've done by declaring open season on the private sector is in fact uh, allowed a lot of people to please the leadership. Mm -hmm. uh by doing what they want one day it's the food uh, uh you know uh, it's the food delivery the other day it's it's the video games where does this this stop i think it creates a fair amount of uncertainty and and you have to as a chinese um uh citizen you you have to believe that a lot of your growth in recent years has been facilitated by the private sector how do you manage this mix in the right way right. in an environment where there are very few checks and balances um, hey, you could take a, a different view in the sense that, I mean, it would converge on the same reality. But I think another another way of reading this is that the, the party under Xi is profoundly preoccupied with the question of ensuring that it retains autonomy. So rather than as it were postulating that they're confident that they are, as it were, in a, capacity, in a, in, in a shape to lead and that they are, as it were, capable, I think they're honest enough with themselves to know, to say to themselves internally that it's a failure of the party that led to the COVID outbreak. In fact, I don't think they, they, you know, in relative terms, of course, they've come out looking much better. But if you'd stopped the clock at the end of February, this yeah. would have been the worst failure of governance that they'd experienced since the beginning of the reform period. So and I, I read their strong arming of, you know, big money in a similar sort of way. It's an effort to preserve their autonomy of action, to not end up beholden to and deep, too deeply entangled with um, business interests, as they you know, retrospectively believe the party had become in the 2000s in the era of the so-called three represents, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the big fear is that they go the same way as the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, which right. lost its way because it basically became entangled with political economy interests it couldn't right. break. Right. Hence the purging, hence the continuous it's sort of right. term the, that they need to carry through. So it, yeah. they, it converges on a reality of absolutely of, of remarkable you know, willingness to disrupt um, which we supposedly adhere to, right? Disruption is supposed <laughs> to be a Western value that we hold dear, right. but they, they actually at the limit seem more willing to push it than we are. Right. So um, there is a big question from um, Julia Almeida, and I think that it all kind of comes down to the picture that you both have painted is the, uh, somewhat of a worry about the amount of actions that have been taken and its long-term implication. So she is asking to say, what is the main takeaway for current economic students and how can hyper-globalization impact the weak economy caused by current events? And that also relates to another question by Will Harahan, and that is that how should we understand let them eat credit in the context of the actions taken by the central banks in the last 18 months? So it's the implications of all these actions going forward. Um, so Adam, you want to take first pass or shall I? 
I'd love to hear what you think economic students should learn from this. To be honest, I don't. I don't have the privilege of teaching teaching economic students. Well, uh, uh, I, yeah. So I, I'd be I, curious. Right, mine is more business school students, but but nevertheless, let me start by saying it's complicated because uh, you know uh, we've got forces going in every direction, as as Adam said. Um, so, for example. Uh, has this pandemic been bad for the middle class? Well, it depends on where. If you look at the emerging markets, terrible. Most of them have not been able to support the middle class. A lot of people have you know, lost jobs, uh, are slipping into poverty, and we will see the consequences only down the line because right now what you see is the upper middle class and the rich with uh, a lot of pent up savings uh, and uh, you know, with the large firms that cater to them, uh, doing quite well in the stock markets, uh, but but down the line we will see the scarring that happens uh, that has happened to the small and medium enterprises and to the uh, middle class and the lower middle class. Uh, if you look at the industrial countries, it could be a different picture. I mean, a lot of poor people in the U.S. I wouldn't say I wouldn't say it's been a it's been a a, a pleasant time. It's obviously been a tragedy. Uh, it's been a difficult time, but some of the flows that came their way allowed some of them to rectify their finances. If you're not spending, but you're getting a fair amount of, uh, of benefits, you can maybe pay down the credit card bill that you, you, you know, has been plaguing you for so long. So uh, household finances may in fact emerge a little better, uh, certainly at the uh, you know, uh, lower middle end than they were earlier. So they don't need that credit. Uh, to spend. In fact, one of the problems many credit card companies have is people are, aren't running up huge bills, uh, mm. and and you know that's 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 where they make the money. So so uh, this also, however, may just set the stage for uh, a burst of spending once you are able to spend and once the goods actually show up, uh, you know, from those supply chains we talked about in the beginning of the period. So it's it's really uh, quite complicated. Um, what's the takeaway? It's very hard to offer a takeaway. I do think that some of the investments we're making in the US and in Europe are really warranted and make sense to put the economy on a more sustainable path, both climatically, but also uh, in improving the lot of, uh, of the people left behind. But we need to be far more clever about it. And, and I would love to see more experimentation in the process rather than this, I'm going to tell you what to do, and here's a lot of money to do it. If I, if I might pick up um, some of Raghu's remarks and link them to a question that Jade Rosenbaum asked about the situation in Africa or Latin America, um, this follows directly on. And, and I think this is really where we must not permit ourselves in the spirit of CGT, a failure of imagination that, as it were, transposes our experience or what we see and hear reported about China to the rest of the world. Because by contrast with 2008, when the rebound in the emerging markets and indeed in low income countries in sub-Saharan Africa was sustained by the ongoing and rapid growth in China, and they came back quite fast, and in fact, converge. Many of them gain access to capital markets for the first time in that period, benefiting from the debt relief of the earlier earlier in the century. That is not the story that we're seeing right now. And, and that is, I think, one of the really alarming situations. It's a matter on the one hand of the fact that they aren't getting the vaccines in Africa, which is a total failure of global leadership, which the IMF has rightly called out. And, and really they deserve credit for banging the drum on this and should continue to go on doing so. And they should have our support um, as people with a platform because it's a scandal. But there is also broader implications. I mean, the, the hit to the Latin American economies is disastrous. And there was quite serious talk there, unfortunately, not about new opportunities, as the question suggests, but rather the reverse, that we could be looking at a decade, another lost decade there. There has been huge damage to education systems and human capital formation in the weaker education systems of the world. And many sub-Saharan African countries, which already so-called frontier markets, which were already in 2018, 19 on the brink of debt distress are now much closer to that <laughs> situation than they were before. And, and I think speaking to people say in the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, it's very important to understand the sense of urgency that that generation of new, of the new Africa, you know, 
the, the sense of urgency that they feel when faced on the one hand by the incredible demographic dynamic which is going to unfold in Africa over the next couple of decades, totally unlike the situation in Asia, let alone in Europe. And on the other hand, the broken growth models of so many of the large countries and the lack of a clear global perspective. Even Chinese money is not flowing to Africa in the way that it was in 2016, 2017. And I think unless the West, in whatever guise, whether it's B3W, you know, build back better world, or we need desperately to formulate some sort of response to this. Because otherwise all the talk about COP26 and sustainable development and so on is for the birds. Because that's where the problem is. And we now have, you know, pretty clear estimations of the level of capital of capital and investment that needs to happen there. For all of the skepticism one may feel about, you know, large scale infrastructure investment and our bad track record, it's undeniable that there have to be key investments in transport, logistics, energy, communications across that continent. And um, 2020 for them is a devastating setback. It's the first year in which sub-Saharan Africa has experienced collective negative growth in decades, perhaps ever, I think, since records began. And, and we should not, this should, you know, this is not headline news, but it really should be. Well, I think that what you're talking about is that actually we are also at the moment where if anything COVID has done is that kind of the hoarding mentality continues to grow and the flow of money that used to be there right now, that kind of global idea is almost not popular, right? And no matter where you are. So the question I had, Raghu, that you haven't really mentioned at all, and that is that we have not mentioned India or Russia. And there's a question about Russia and where that's gonna come out. But I'm also interested in the negative growth in India and what has happened during this time. What's your prognosis for India? And what do you both think about Russia? And then we'll try to bring this to a well, close. Uh, well, in India will rebound. Um, yeah. um, you know, you go down deep enough, you come back. Uh, <laughs> now that's not a reason to celebrate and say V-shaped because uh, if, you, if you constrain the economy uh, really, uh, obviously you get a V-shaped recovery. The question is how far behind your growth trajectory are you and when do you catch up? And it was but, worse even before COVID, right? It was slowing before COVID, but even that slow, slowing growth, it's going to take us quite some time to get back to where we were going. And of course, the problem in India clearly is we don't have the kind of safety nets that exist right. in the US or so there is pain. There is a tremendous amount of pain, which is disguised by a buoyant stock market. And uh, I think the uh, the point that Adam made, that we tend to focus on the uh, well-to-do at this point and see how well they have survived the, the, the pandemic, but there's an enormous amount of damage done in the world. And, and people have been set back significantly. And, and for them to climb back up takes a long time uh, the kids in school, for example, you, you're out of school for a year and a half effectively because none of these uh, students have access to, to the aids uh, that are there in, uh, in, in good schools, uh, the technological aids. But one and a half years out of school means you're actually three years behind. What that means is that your parents at this point are thinking, what's the point of putting them back in school? They're so far behind. Lots of uh, kids drop out. Lots of girls get married off at a young age in, in India. Lots of boys get uh, sent to agriculture uh, as opposed to you know, moving into the service sector or manufacturing. That's a huge setback. And that shows up you know, five, 10, 20 years down the line uh, for this entire cohort. It's not just one year, it's the entire cohort which is in school. So, I mean, countries have to be thinking very seriously about remedial action and not thumping that chest about what the latest growth number is. I mean, that is just, uh, uh, you know, neither here nor there. Uh, I, I also think that, I mean, so R Russia, I'm, I, I, I know less about. I, I would say that uh, certainly, uh, you know, the high price of oil today is helping uh, Russia as it all has always helped. But the clear problem in Russia over time has been how does it generate more diversification in its economy? And whether you know, the COVID pandemic will finally get them to move in that direction, uh, my sense is as of now, uh, the answer is probably not. And, and, and the reality about Russia is, is how, you know, for such a, a developed country in terms of human capital, 
uh, it has uh, underperformed its uh, its capabilities uh, you know for the last 20 30 years uh, you know you uh, of course post uh, post the uh, collapse of the soviet union so it it is uh, it is a worry and i do hope that uh, russia gets its act uh, together last point and uh, i'll i'll stop here i i i uh, i mean on the global cooperation uh, uh, you know adam uh, raised this issue I really worry because uh, what we're going to see with this kind of devastation uh, under the surface in many emerging markets is a move to the extremes, whether it's the extreme right or the extreme left. Uh, certainly, there will be demagogues who show up, as we've seen in the industrial countries, but many more of them. And, and the question is, do the sound policies that we've seen in the 90s, of course, they didn't do enough distribution. We need to think about that more effectively. Uh, they didn't build capabilities in their people. But do we sort of throw everything out of the window and start again with policies which we know are, are failures? Uh, how, do we, how do these countries come out? That's gonna be very important for the globe, especially because we're gonna see an emergence of a quasi cold war and countries being forced to choose and, and, you know, the fact that they are in a worse economic situation makes it much more comp complicated for them. Yeah. So the, the specter of the U.S.-China rivalry and how that plays out in the emerging economies would be another issue that has to be paid attention to, as you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, we're almost out of time, but there is a one question about the Brexit and the UK policy supply side, it's very technical. So I'm not gonna go there. I'm sorry, Emmanuel, but I do want to ask both of you the question. And that is, let's say we're sitting here two years from now or three years from now, hopefully COVID is behind us. How, what is your prognosis of the global economic condition two or three years from now? what needs to happen and what you think will happen. Adam. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. too much, your chance. <laughs> Adam, it's in fact, you said it in the book, you know, so I, I would love to know what do you- Well, I mean, my- thing is what are you worried about? What you think could happen and what should happen? Yeah, I mean, the two or three year time horizon is the difficult bit. It's like, as it were, to time these things and to be clear about what comes together. But mm -hmm. the book ends, by asking the question, I mean, for a historian to end a book like this about a piece of history that isn't finished yet is, is you know, a difficult job. Um, and so I, I sort of do it by asking a sort of hypothetical, like, you know, is there any reason to believe that we have tamed the cycle of um, the spiraling interconnection and mutual interdependence, codependency between central bank intervention and financial markets? No. Is there any reason to believe that we have tamed the centrifugal logic of democratic polities, as Raghu was just saying? No, the opposite. Is there any reason to believe that we have any prospect of reconciling the two, you know, the United States to the inevitable emergence of China as a much greater player and to the centrifugal forces of, of, of global power? No. Um, is there any reason to believe that we are really going to get on top of the accelerating risks of blowback that come from the natural environment into the economy and society, which were long predicted with regard not just to the climate, but with regard to pandemic risk? Are we substantially, are we, do, are we confident that we'd be substantially better prepared the next time? Surely not. So on that basis, you know, once upon a time with that kind of checklist, you would have said, sure, well, the revolution will come soon and we'll solve it <laughs> by means of that, right? That's, but, but and that would seem fatuous at this point. So the best bet I think is as it were that we see ongoing crisis management of different types, perhaps limited areas of structural reform that would allow us to be better prepared. But that is the kind of horizon that I, that I lay out. And, and I don't from there then say, oh, well, this is, you know, this is, that is, of course, far better than nothing. Like, far better to manage a crisis than to not manage a crisis. Far better to do what Europe did in 2020 than what it did in 2010. 
Um, but it doesn't answer some of the longer term, you know, risks that Raghu is so 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 well brought into the discussion today. So that's that's my general diagnosis of the situation. Escalating the tension point is very escalating yeah. escalation tension. Yeah. And this, I mean, the final sentence of the book is we ain't seen nothing yet. You know, th this for me is just as it were the beginning of an increasingly complex series of crises. Raghu. Yes, yeah, no, I, I I can't add anything to that 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 statement other than saying I agree completely. Things are going to get more interesting in a in a in a very <laughs> uh, kind of unfortunate way. Yeah. way <laughs> interesting, the Chinese character. Exactly, yeah. exactly, <laughs> exactly. And 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 I I um, you know I, I I think our best chance is to muddle through. Uh, I mean, if you ask me the question. Where do I think there's a more of a chance of muddling through without big changes? I would say, I mean, without uh, you know deep changes in in lifestyles and livelihoods. I think Europe is 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 well poised, mm -hmm. but I think many other places have a lot of thinking to do, including the United States. I'd say it's, it's going to be an interesting time because of the social net, uh, safety network that actually is so weak here. Yeah. Well, thank you so very, very much. Thank you all for joining us. I hope that this gives you a taste of the kind of things that we should be thinking about. And I hope it has served as a catalyst for further thinking for all of you. Thank you, Professor Rajan, and thank you, Professor Tooze, for joining us. And hope to see you again for Committee on Global Thought events. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.